welcome everybody. Um, we are going to um, talk about the new staffing bill and how we can better utilize this for our staffing committees and how to go about doing that. And so hopefully we have a lot of people that are on staffing Staff. committees today. Um, I think it's gonna pretty much just be an open forum and we're gonna um, have a presentation on it. And then also we just really wanna hear from you guys uh, what you think about the bill, what you think it's going to be easy to implement, hard to implement, what you need help with, that kind of thing, um, and how we can move forward educating um, and just assisting and, and different things we might do. Like, you know, one of the things we were throwing around is, you know, maybe we should meet, you know, maybe not monthly, but maybe every other month or quarterly or something like that. All the people that are on the staffing committee or head the staffing committees to just see how it's going and to help each other out on instituting this bill. Cause you know, we got it passed, but now we have to get it implemented, which is sometimes difficult to do. So um, maybe we'll just start off with, um, is CC gonna present? Okay, all right, CC. We, we, we both, yeah, we, we both are. All right, yeah. you guys go ahead and tag team. Yeah, and, and I'll share in just a second. I just wanna give you all a heads up. Um, the the powerpoint is a there's a lot of information on the powerpoint because we're doing a deep dive into the law um you know normally you do a presentation you wouldn't include all that but the problem is is there's so much information that it'd be impossible for you to memorize it so we wanted to include all the information on the powerpoint and then make it available to you so that as you're in your committee you can use this as a reference um so just kind of keep that in mind and I wouldn't try to memorize everything that's said here, right? Just get kind of a feel for it and you can go back to it as it's helpful once you start working on it. So without further ado, let me, uh... all right, does that look right to everyone? Yeah. All right, take it away, Cece. Yeah, hi everyone. So like Logan said, um, this meeting is being recorded and the recording of this presentation as well as the PowerPoint itself is going to be made available um, in our safe staffing toolkit on the AFT Connecticut website. But so we're going to get started. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our deep dive into the role, responsibilities, and functions of hospital staffing committees under the new law that provides for adequate, safe um, healthcare staffing. We will be covering other aspects of the legislation <laughs> in another presentation um, at the next Healthcare Council meeting on August 28th. I want to introduce myself to in case folks don't know who I am. My name is Cece and I'm an organizer with AFT Connecticut. And I'm Logan Place. I'm a field representative with AFT Connecticut. So being an effective committee is going to be really critical to utilizing the power that this legislation gives nurses. And I encourage all of you to think of staffing committee meetings like you would contract negotiations. You want to be prepared. Oh, Cece, I think your voice is cutting out. Are other people having a hard time hearing her? Yeah, she's They're frozen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cece, are you there? I think she's frozen now. All right. I'll, oh, Cece, you there? Yeah. All right. Now we can hear you. I'm going to stop my video just in case. Um, so you're miss Yeah, start with over be prepared because it uh, cut out there. Gotcha. So your committee needs to be prepared to gather information. To do this, your committee can utilize the AFT Connecticut Safe Staffing Toolkit that we have on our website. You can also submit information requests to the hospital. And most importantly, your committee is going to be talking with the bedside nurses in your hospitals and across departments to understand you know, the reality of staffing, how the staffing ratios are impacting nurses, how the staffing plan is working and whether the staffing plan is being complied with. Your committee should also be prepared to analyze staffing data, present your staffing grid at committee meetings. This is going to be a really big role that the labor side of staffing committees has, and also to prepare an agenda for each meeting and also to review meeting minutes from the previous staffing committee sessions. Ensuring your committee is effective will require, as you all know, having bedside nurses on the staffing committee that are unified and strong in voting in other positions you take. So that's not to say that internal disagreements aren't gonna happen. It's okay that they do and they probably will. But once you reach a decision, your nurses must be united at the staffing committee meetings in that decision. Because bedside nurses are gonna be making up the majority of staffing committees, do not let management control the meeting. This is 
your staffing committee. And all of this requires I'll, I'll pick up and, and CC can jump in when they rejoin. All of it requires to be organized. Obviously, you want to maintain records of minutes, your notes, and all, all the research you perform. CC, cut me off as soon as whenever you can, uh, and I'll stop if I hear you. I got it from here. Can you hear oh, me? I hear you. Good. Okay, so nurses have rights. It's illegal for a hospital to retaliate for a nurse for participating in their staffing committee raising concerns of unsafe staffing, workplace violence, racism, or bullying, and for filing complaints with the staffing committee or expressing concerns to the staffing committee. Can go to the next slide, please. So when starting your staffing committee, it's important to know who's on the committee, what that makeup is going to look like. The majority of the members on the staffing committee must be direct care nurses. Under this law, there is a 50% plus one rule. That means the total number of bedside nurses on the staffing committee must be one more than the total number of non-bedside nurses on the staffing committee. So how is this done? Well, your nurses union selects the bedside nurse members that make up no less than 50% of the committee. Like I touched on um, previously, you talk to people in, from different departments and get them on your committee. Then for the plus one bedside nurse, um, a representative of your union will give the hospital a list. Of, <laughs> will give the hospital a list of multiple names of bedside nurses, from which hospital management will select one additional nurse member to serve in addition to the fifty percent of nurses already on the staffing committee. So that's that fifty percent plus one rule. Then the hospital selects the remaining members of the committee to serve on the staffing committee that will be representing management. And I really want to point out the power here in this situation. Your nurses union has control over not only who is on the list that management chooses from to serve as the plus one, but who also makes up that 50%, making the staffing committee a majority of bedside nurses. And it should be noted, like we touched on um, in the beginning of this meeting, that this is not how this is done at non-union hospitals under this legislation. Your staffing committees have much more power because you have a union at your hospital. Next slide, please. So I want to clarify. So this slide is just an example. Um, if you have a staffing committee, uh, you would, could have six members who are direct care nurses, bedside nurses that's selected directly by the union. Then you have six members who are not direct care nurses selected by the hospital, right, by management. That could be like the director of nursing. It could even be someone like from HR if they wanted to. Uh, and then you have one member who is a direct care registered nurse selected from a, a list provided by the union, right? So um, that plus one, it, all the legislation says is a, a list of multiple names. So you could, in theory, provide a list to management with two names, right? And say you have to select one of these two people as the plus one that gives us the majority. CC, you back? So what the legislation specifically says is that as for how many, right, is that there's broad representation. So it says each hospital staffing committee shall include broad-based representation across hospital services. The law does not specifically say how many, right, um, that need to be on that. That will probably in part depend on the hospital and its size and, um, you know, other factors, but it does say it has to be broad representation. So you're gonna to wanna to have as many representatives as possible from at least all the major departments or service lines in the hospital, right? So maybe um, you have one from ED, you have one um, that covers all of surgical services, right? One service line, right? Um, that's something you're gonna to have to work out with the committee, um, but the more, uh, it's better to have more, right? Better representation. The uh, your collective bargaining agreement might set forth a specific number or dictate that, but this law will take precedent over it. Um, but I, I would recommend that when it comes time to renegotiate your collective bargaining agreement, you make it consistent with what the law says. 
selecting committee members. Um, so how do you select them? Well, you're gonna to have departments uh, put forth someone they trust, right? The nurses on those departments, service lines, units, uh, that, and they respect to serve on the committee, can ask for volunteers, uh, and make sure, again, to get that broad representation. All right, so, oops, what does a staffing committee do? Um, well, first and foremost, they develop the staffing plan, right? And we'll go over in a little bit what is in the staffing plan. Um, but under the law, their primary job is to develop a staffing plan. And under the new legislation, uh, the following four requirements, uh, the following four things are required for the committee to review as they are making that plan. So first, evaluate the most recent research regarding patient outcomes, right? So that's gonna be really important that you do your research ahead of time so you can bring the research that supports your position the most. Second, the staffing committee is required to share the process for communicating concerns to the committee on both the staffing plan and staffing assignments within the hospital to the hospital staff. You, we should be doing this anyways, right? Because that we're a union, that's what we do, but the committee is required to do that. And then the committee is required to review all reports that they get from staff about the above mentioned concerns, right? So if someone submits a concern about the staffing plan or about a staffing assignment that doesn't comport with the staffing plan, they review that. And then finally, they are required to review objections or refusals by an RN to participate in an unsafe staffing assignment. Now, um, as CC mentioned earlier, there's another part of the legislation that we're not gonna dig too far into today relating to objections or refusals uh, by an RN to participate in a, a task they're not qualified or competent to do safely. Um, if a nurse does that and, and fills out that form, that would also go to the committee for review. Second, and this is what the committee does under the legislation. Now, obviously, the committee can do more than what's in the legislation, but in the legislation, under the new legislation, it says that the committee is to review complaints submitted by an RN because the task would violate the staffing plan. So in the last slide, I mentioned the situation where you object or refuse because you're not qualified, competent, and that's a very serious complaint to submit. You have to, it's a very detailed process. Um, you can only do it in certain circumstances. There's all these rules around it. This one is more equivalent to what a lot of hospitals have as their unsafe staffing form. So if, for example, you get an assignment that is out of ratio with the plan or is just unsafe and in some way violates the plan or policy adopted by the committee, RN fills that out, it gets submitted to the hospital and the staffing committee, right? And then the both the hospital individually and with the staffing committee needs to analyze the complaint and provide a DPH with that analysis and the actions taken in response to that complaint. Now, those complaints, have to get filed with DPH by the hospital in their biannual reporting relating to their ratios. We're gonna get into that later, so I don't wanna get too into that, but the important part to take away here is, is that this will get reported to DPH. So it is really important, right, for enforcement purposes, and we'll get into that more later, that nurses either individually or if they wanna sign as a group, right, fill out this form when ever there's an assignment that is not in line with the staffing uh, plan submitted by the staffing committee, all right? We really, I, I can't stress how important that is. All right, so next, this is gonna just talk about, you know, the procedures and the functions under the legislation of how the staffing committee works. So first of all, as with most committees, you need a quorum and the legislation defines a quorum as, a majority of the members on the staffing committee make up a quorum. So a quorum is needed to make any sort of official decision or take any vote or really do anything other than have a discussion. Um, so if the staffing committee has 13 people, right, at least seven of the people would need to be there in order for any business to take place at that meeting. Voting. Um, Majority rule, so decisions must be made by a majority of the staff, right? If it's 50-50%, uh, well, actually, technically, it could never be 50-50%, but if if there were 13 people on the committee, 
you would need, again, seven people to, it, 13 people on the committee and are present, right? It's a majority of those present at the meeting um, and able to vote. That is what you would need to make a decision. Now, this was referenced earlier. Janice brought this up. And this is probably the most or one of the most important parts of the bill is not only do direct care nurses make up a majority of the committee, but they are by law always required to have a majority vote. So if RNs, uh, if the direct care RNs at this particular meeting, um, and there's fewer of them than management, then enough people in management need to recuse themselves or abstain for voting in order for the direct care RNs to have a majority vote. So that's a little complicated. So let me go through an example to explain that a little bit. So say at a staffing meeting, right, there's a lot of absences that day for whatever reason, and there are four managers there and three direct care nurses, right? And let's assume that that establishes a quorum to vote. Now they're about to take up a vote. Direct care RNs always have to have one more, right? 50% plus one. So of the four managers, two would have to abstain from voting and only two would vote, whereas in all three direct care RNs can vote. That means no matter what vote is taken, direct care RNs always control the majority of the vote, which is frankly awesome. Um, so this is why being prepared and making sure we vote in unison is so extremely important. That is where your power comes in, right? Um, if you're prepared ahead of time and you're ready to take votes and you vote together, you will control the staffing committee. Phil, I'll get to you in just a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just get through a couple more slides. Um, keeping on with the procedures and how the committee functions, minutes must be taken at every meeting. Uh, now, keep in mind that these minutes will be made available to any hospital staff or DPH when they request it. So it's really important that these are taken proper, that you review them, that you will make sure that they're accurate and you uh, and you know favorable and before you vote to approve them. Uh, one recommendation we have is to possibly alternate who takes minutes at each meeting. So one meeting management takes uh, minutes, one meeting RNs take uh, the minutes. That kind of balances the power out, splits up the duties. Um, so just a suggestion, that part is not required by law, but a recommendation. Um, and then co-chairs, this was brought up. So each committee has will now have two co-chairs once this law goes into effect. There's a direct care registered nurse, right? And that's elected by the people we appoint, the direct care RNs on the committee. will appoint the co-chair that represents the nurses. And then there's one who's elected by the people who are not direct care RNs, AKA management, right? And even that person though, the law does specifically say they need to have patient care experience. So if they are a, a human resources person who's never stepped foot in a, a, a hospital room, right? You know, just are on the business side and have never worked in patient care, they could not serve on the co-chair but a director of nursing who used to be a bedside nurse could, right? Because they have direct care experience. Um, and this is, I believe, the last slide before I'll take the next round of questions. So attending the meeting coverage. Each hospital shall ensure that RNs have coverage to attend hospital staffing committee meetings. So this is really important, right? If you are scheduled to work, right, you are entitled to attend that meeting and it is the hospital's responsibility to make sure that there's adequate and safe coverage for you to attend, okay? Don't let them tell you uh, we, we don't have coverage. They are required by law to provide that coverage so that you can attend the meeting. Payment, this wasn't already happening, it really should have been, but now the law is very clear that you pay nurses while they sit on the committee. Now, if this is during your normal work time, you just get paid normal, you know, just count towards your hours if you're during normal work time. If it's, out, if it's on a day off or outside of your normal hours, you would get paid your normal pay, including differentials. And then hours, to the extent possible, the time on the committee is counts towards your regular budgeted hours. Um, now, obviously, it's qualified with the phrase to the extent possible, right? If the committee meets at 1 p.m. and you work 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., it's going to be hard to count that towards your normal regular budgeted hours. But in general, that is supposed to be the case. And lastly, how often does the committee meet? 
the law does not specify, we recommend at least monthly. Um, you know, for the first round, when you're developing this staffing plan that, you know, at most hospitals, you probably have a staffing plan, although not all, but you probably have a staffing plan, but you're going to be really revamping it. You may need to meet even more. Um, in subsequent years, right, once you have a plan you're happy with and you're just tweaking it, maybe you meet less often, um, but you still have other responsibilities, right? Reviewing complaints, reviewing, um, you know, other staffing issues that come up, you know, duties that are outside the law as well as other duties inside the law. Month, I, I would recommend pushing to meet at least monthly, but the, again, the law does not require it. It does require that you get all of everything accomplished in the law, which is going to require more than meeting more than two or three times before submission. All right, so with that, I am gonna pause again. All right, so just to go through what's included in the staffing plan, the, this slide and the next slide are both, um, can you see this screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yep. th these are things that are already included in it. I'm not gonna sit here and read through it all. Um, you can go back and do it, but we included it here so that you can use this as a checklist as you're developing your plan, right? What already has to be included. This is also stuff that under the old law and current law already be included. You'll notice on uh, one through three here, right? Those are the parts that deal with ratios. You'll notice it doesn't just include RNs. It also includes LPN, so the extent your hospital uses them, and assistive personnel, which is defined in the statute. But uh, would be like PCTs, tax, things of that nature. These are the new requirements, and this is what I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on. Um, information about objections or refusal to comply with the nurse staffing plan by hospital staff, community case committee, we've already kind of talked about that. Measurements of and evidence to support successful implementation of the nurse staffing plan. Three, I really like. Uh, the retention, turnover, and recruitment rate. So they have to talk about the, the, the plan, right? Needs to include information, right? And this is gonna be publicly available of the turnover rate during the last year at the hospital. It's also gonna require that you put in the average years of experience of permanent direct care registered nurses on each unit. Um, this is gonna be really important, I think, for, for tracking how hospitals are doing um, on retention. Uh, number four, the number of instances uh, since the, you know, over the last six months where they weren't compliant with the plan and how they plan on complying with it in the future and certification that the hospital and its staffing committee are meeting the requirements set forth in the legislation. All right. Another part of the legislation is about increasing transparency and uh, better reporting requirements. So um, hospital must notify all employee, employees about the committee. This is particularly important at non-union hospitals where um, most people don't even know that a committee exists. I think at most union hospitals, we have established a committee, although not all of, all of them, but this is important. So uh, employees know that this exists how they can report concerns, how to get on the committee, things like that. Um, staff, we touched on this already, but staffing committee meeting minutes must be made available to staff and DPH upon request. The staffing plan must be submitted to DPH twice a year. Under the old law, it was one time a year. And the reason I think that this is important is because it allows more opportunity to improve a plan, right? You say you want to try something out. Um, or set a certain ratio, you're not locked into it for a year, you're locked into it for six months. Um, so you can you know, gradually do things or you can try something now and if it doesn't work in six months, you can change it. Um, the staffing plan is available to the staff and the public and DPH upon request. So that staffing plan is gonna be made publicly available and the hospital is required to post a copy of that plan in a prominent area visible and accessible to staff, patients, and members of the public on each unit. So that plan has got to be posted on every unit. And then this is this one's also big: is the hospital has to maintain records of the actual ratios that they have. So it's one thing to have the plan, but they have to maintain. Okay, well, on this day on this unit, 
what was our actual ratios, and they have to maintain those records for the preceding three years. And those records are available to staff, union, DPH, patients, and the public upon request. So that's gonna all be public information and it will be really important in the enforcement side of this. Speaking of uh, enforcement, great news, this law is enforceable. Uh, DPH has the uh, power to impose fines if they don't comply with the legislation, specifically if they don't maintain a staffing committee with all the requirements in the law, um, if they don't post the staffing plan, um, they also have to, and we'll talk about this more on the next slide, but they have to submit a report to DPH indicating they complied with the ratios at least 80% of the time. Um, and if they fail to do any of those things or fail to actually comply with the 80% rule, uh, the Commissioner of Public Health on the first violation will give them a corrective action plan and a penalty of 3500 And on the second offense and each subsequent offense, $5,000. So starting October 1st, 2024, so a year from October, every six months, starting on October 1st, the hospital must certify to DPH whether it has been, uh, whether it has comp uh, complied with the staffing assignments and ratios at least 80% of the time. This is 80% of the time on every unit, right? Um, and they have to submit this report every six months. And we need to do the work of holding them accountable by tracking and reviewing um, the actual ratios they are required to maintain and to make sure that they're maintaining those ratios accurately and not budgeting the numbers there. And then, so this is one way, right, that a hospital could be fined, right, is these reports show that they're not maintained, complying 80% of the time, they're going to get fined. The other way is that DPH can do an audit. Um, and part of these audits will be random, right? DPH will randomly select just as the IRS would with taxes, um, select the hospital to audit. Um, but, the, um, uh, well, I'll get to the other way in a second, but the uh, hospital pays the cost of the audit, which is a good thing. And the audit includes assess an assessment of compliance with all the legal requirements of the plan, the accuracy of the report submitted and the, uh, membership of the hospital staffing committee. So again, as I said, it sometimes can be random, but DPH can also consider factors such as consistent non-compliance with staffing plan. They suspect or fear that there's been false reporting or any other healthcare quality concerns could spark an audit. Now, one of the great things that we got when we went through this legislation um, is, and this you won't see this in the bill, but it was in the budget, is we, we got additional funding for DPH to hire, uh, I believe it's two additional staff to be able to do these audits and go through these reporting requirements. Um, everyone here knows that DPH, D DPH is um, underfunded and often backed up in their ability to enforce the law, but there should be people dedicated specifically to this. Um, so given this, right, given the facts, the factors they will look at in determining who to audit. It's really important that nurses submit those complaints if staffing plans aren't being followed and that committee members and the unions notify DPH if we believe or suspect there's any reporting inaccuracy. Um, so roles and responsibility of the hospital, right? We've gone through all of this, but I, I, I just we just put this here to to kind of as a checklist to think about what the hospital needs to be doing and that these things are not your responsibility on the committee or even the committee's responsibility, right? It's the hospital that has to implement the staffing plan. It's the hospital that has to submit the staffing plan to DPH. They have to post it. They have to provide necessary information to the staffing committee so that they can create the plan. They have to submit re those reports said DPH, right? That they're complying at least 80% of the time. They have to maintain the records um, and then we talked about this a little bit, but there's uh, the legislation contemplates two forms, right? They have to create both of those forms and get DPH to approve it. One is the objection to assignment, and the other one is a complaint form for non-compliance with the staffing plan. So last, before we get into more questions and discussion, just wanted to have a slide on the timeline. So October 1st, 2023, the new law takes effect. Um, 
but don't wait, right? If, you know, there's a lot to get done um, by the time you need to submit the first one, which is January 1st. If the hospital is willing, get going on the new staffing committee under the new rules, right? Uh, January 1st, 2024, the Staffing plan under the new legislation has to be submitted to DPH, and then it will be resubmitted every six months. And then October 1st, 2024, the hospital certifies its compliance with the staffing plan, the 80% over the previous six months, and also reports complaints submitted by RNs. Well, I just want to just briefly thank everybody. Um, I know we've lost some people because it has been a little long, but um, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered as we go along. And I, and, and I think this is gonna take a couple of years to fully develop. Um, uh, I do think that it seems like uh, regular meetings of basically this group, which would be like the statewide staffing committee um, is a good way to start. Um, and I know we're going to, in addition to that, I we probably will have to do some, some work with individual staffing committees at different hospitals. So we'll see how that has to develop based on what people think they need. Um, but we also um, are going to um, start next month, um, a month from now with a training thing for all of the healthcare members, more, more treetop than this discussion, but for all of the healthcare members. So I think probably somebody else can fill in on that a little bit more. So I'll reach out, I'll be reaching out to to the leaders on this on this call about when we might get together again to continue the discussion. That's it then. Thank you everyone for coming and we will um, be having a meeting on uh, August 28th that you can invite any nurse at the hospital at all that wants to hear more about this bill. So if you know we'll send the link out to all of healthcare council and then hopefully it'll well can we send it out actually I went to all of healthcare? I already sent. Perfect. I, I know I got it, but I never really know how it goes. Awesome, Rosemary. Thank you. Maybe, and I'm sure we'll send out a reminder because they're great at that. Um, all right. So see you guys on August 28th.